that. Ah, uh, well, she's more the writer. I, I told the story. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, she wrote. I told the story. I lived it. I mean, come on. Yeah, you're like, I needed someone to be there. Exactly. Yeah. She's my ghost writer. There you go. That's awesome. Okay, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about your time here at okay. Fort Sill. So, um, what? When did you come here? I got here in uh, August of actually July is when I arrived. My my welcome ceremony uh, was August of uh, 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. So who did you relieve when they were here? Actually, my, my uh, predecessor was already gone. Uh, now Brigadier General Mark Holler uh, was the commandant, and he had PCS to uh, Hawaii to take command of the 94th WMDC. So he was gone for about three, three and a half months before I arrived. Mm -hmm. I was in Korea. I, I was serving as EXO for a four-star, and the transition, because of the virus, you know, the transition kind of got uh, a little elongated because when inbounds came in from the states, the Korean government had people stay two weeks you know, in quarantine, so that added to my time. So I got here late, late July, and then uh, we had a welcome ceremony on the, on the OPQ, the, the field there, and, uh, and myself and the FA Commandant, uh, General Brooks, uh, were welcome, along with our Sergeant Majors, were welcome uh, doing that, uh, that ceremony. Okay, cool, so you've been here for almost two years. Almost two years, yeah, almost two years. Okay, um, and whenever you came in, you were a uh, full bird. I was. I was a colonel. We were waiting on uh, Senate confirmation. So it was a unique uh, position to be in, you know, kind of filling a, a one-star's uh, billet, uh, but, but being a colonel, uh, and even non-promotable, too. So, But uh, the professionalism across FCO was, was great. Uh, the, the officers, NCO soldiers, they, they knew that being in this position, that it was a strong possibility that I would be a general. And so they treated me with utmost respect. So I, I can't say enough about well, the, the climate that General Camper has created here really uh, is, is one that of, of mutual respect and respect for, uh, for for everyone, not just you know colonels uh, and now brigadier generals. So, but uh, it was it was sort of uh, unique. Uh, I, I'll tell you a story. Pulling up every day at my parking space behind the building, seeing the one star on that placard, it was motivational. It was inspiring to know that one day that that star on that placard would be on my chest, my uniform. Uh, so, so when I parked my truck in the mornings before I got promoted, that was kind of my motivation was to pull in there and see that star and go, man, one day I'll have that on my uniform. So that was, that was my time here, initially, how I felt. Okay, cool. So how long did it take for you to get promoted? Oh, great question. I, I didn't get confirmed until uh, March of 2001. Uh, and I got promoted on uh, uh, June 2nd, uh, oh, 2001. Yeah, 2021. Yeah, so just not even a year yet I've, uh, I've been a general, so still a baby general. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you're doing a great job. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so what, if you had to sum up in like one word, or one word, not one word, <laughs> one sentence, uh -huh. you can have more than one word. Thank you, appreciate um, that. <laughs> if you could sum up maybe in one sentence what um, being the commandant for the air defense artillery is, uh, what would you say? Like, what, what is your actual, like, your actual job as a commandant? Oh, great question. Re really, my job is the uh, proponent for the air defense branch. So in terms of uh, setting the, um, uh, the the course in the future for our branch, how, how are we going to protect the maneuver force and protect the uh, critical assets for our, for our, our commanders out there? It's uh, really training, uh, overseeing the training of uh, the, uh, the, the training base here at Fort Seal. Uh, so our AIT students, you know, our Bullock students, our Triple C students, our warrant officers, our NCOs that go to the uh, the NCO course here over at the uh, NCO Academy. It's really setting the uh, setting the course material for that. Uh, also, it's a little bit in terms of uh, how do you bring in new equipment into our branch. Uh, one of my key uh, key uh, responsibilities is helping with doctrine writing. We we typically uh, kind of bend things in the dot mil PF uh, domains. Uh, D being doctrine, I'm responsible for that. Dot D helps me with that along with our team. Organization, the O, uh, we're responsible. The Okada team helps us with HRC of building the organization. Okay, let's say it's a, it's a Patriot battery. What types of soldiers, what ranks do you need in a Patriot battery? Our team upstairs along with the Okada team and the team over in, uh, over in the seated, they help us develop that organization, uh, what that battery looks like. Also responsible for training. You know, how do we train at that battery? How do we get those soldiers ready to perform their wartime mission? So the team over at Dot D helps my team develop the training requirements uh, to, to certify a battery, training requirements to ensure that soldiers are prepared to do their wartime mission. The other domain that I focus on is leader development. 
Uh, that's when we do the schoolhouse. That's when we do the functional courses that we teach, you know, to uh, the master gunner courses, the Patriot Master Gunner, the Avenger Master Gunner, to make our air defenders, you know, that much more, you know, uh, proficient at the weapon system. Uh, and also, how do we develop them to employ that weapon system on the battlefield? So developing them to be leaders when they leave here. So that's a key component. And then a lot that the other domains, the P domain, the personnel domain. How many people do we need? in that battery. We help to determine that and we also determine uh, where the Army needs to work levers to control the population of uh, 14 series all across all MOSs. So we are a key component in that. So that's some of the responsibilities that I have. When I first took over, uh, General Rainey was the CG of CAC and he said, hey, yeah, I have two priorities for you. is develop leaders and to drive change. Uh, I gravitate to develop leaders because that's what I, I, I'm used to doing. That's what I enjoy doing. The driving change was a little bit tough. Uh, and it was something that was, you know, foreign to me. I, I spent my time in, in force comm units, so this is my first TRADOC unit. So uh, I, I kind of let the other folks, the CDIDs of the world, you know, General, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Colonel Rauscher and, and the CFT, General Gibson, I let that, those team members work on, you know, kind of uh, driving change into the organization, bringing in new equipment. I focus on developing leaders, and, I, and that's what General Rainey said. I wanted you to focus on uh, develop leaders. And now that General um, Martin has taken over as a CAC commander, he's expounded on those two priorities and really wants us to continue to steward the profession, continue to show the Army as a profession. It's the profession of choice, not the last resort. Uh, so I've, I've made my way around to my hometown. I went back to Raleigh, North Carolina, where I enlisted in the Army in 1990, November the 5th. You know, so almost 32 years ago, I went back to that MEP station, different building, but in the same general area. And I, I got a chance to walk around and talk to, you know, uh, Army uh, new enlistees uh, and, and to really share with them that 31 years ago, I sat right where you were sitting, you know, eyes wide about joining the Army. Uh, and now look what the Army has offered me and, and, and afforded me to be a Brigadier General. So it's uh, that part of my job as a commandant to go out and work the priorities of my bosses. You know, steward in the profession, being, being, a, being a steward of the profession, you know, developing leaders, and assisting in driving change really has been the, the cornerstone of what the Commandant does. Not to mention I signed the St. Barbara's Awards as well, too. Wow, you do a lot. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> actually, that helps me um, just know some more about what you actually do. And, and give me just one second. Sure. <laughs> and we're great. All right, then. Good deal. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so I actually didn't know about a lot of that stuff that you do, so you just taught me some things. Thank you. That's good. That's good. I feel tired talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, my work here is enough. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I just wanted to kind of go over and ask you, you know, like, what are some of the highlights from since you've oh. been here? What are some of the fun things that you've gotten to do since you? Oh, great been, question. Been on the post or you know went TDY or whatever you've done. Sure, I think the highlight for me as I thought about this question is really going down and having brown bag lunches with the student population. When Sergeant Major and I would go and have lunch with the, the Bullet class, the Triple C class, the ALC SOC class. That was the highlight. I mean, because you walk in and they're all bright eyed and they're excited. You know, the general's coming in and a command sergeant major's coming in and they're going to impart on us some wisdom, you know. And, and I, would be, I would tell my story. Typically, the first engagement with that population, be it a bullet class or a triple C class, I tell my story and I tell what motivated me to, you know, to, to continue service. And what, what really got me into you know, military service was uh, my NCOs back in ROTC, you know, seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself. So I share that story with them, how really NCOs help officers become, you know, uh, reach their full potential. Uh, and then I would, uh, my second visit, I would take a video, a TED Talk, and I'd use that 15, 20 minutes so I could eat uh, while they watched the video. And then we'd get up and talk about the video, the lessons learned, the things that the, that the, uh, the, uh, the, the person being interviewed or person doing the TED Talk, what they wanted to convey. We talk about that. General McChrystal was one that I used quite a bit. Just yesterday, we used uh, Simon Sinek, you know, start with why. Uh, so it gives the the, uh, uh, the student population uh, a chance to spend time with Sergeant Major and I, but also gives them a chance to think outside the box, to, to using you know uh, TED talks and things like that to to really pull the lessons out of there for leadership that they can uh, they can employ when they go out to their first unit of assignment or if they go back to the force. So I say the brown bag lunches were my exciting times. Uh, TDYs were fun. Uh, it, it was always great to uh, to get out of the out of Fort Zero for a while and and to see the rest of the uh, the rest of the world. Uh, I had a chance to go to uh, uh, to speak at um, at Auburn University uh, down in Georgia. Uh, exciting because I've never been to Auburn. First of all, and, and I'm not a I'm not a, a a Roll Tide or an Auburn fan either. One I'm from North Carolina, so I root for 
teams in North Carolina typically. Uh, but it was just great to go and see a campus and see the program uh, that they put together there, for ROTC program they put together there. Uh, and then uh, just to be you know, really treated as a, a really a guest. Although I wasn't an alumni, they still treated me, you know, I got the royal treatment uh, from, the, uh, from the cadre and from the students there at Auburn. So uh, that's really the uh, exciting time. Uh, the last thing I'll bring up is uh, branch night at West Point. When I had a chance to go to West Point and to see, I'd never, I didn't attend West Point, I went to ROTC, but to see how they execute branch night, where they bring all the cadets in this huge auditorium. Uh, there's a guest speaker there this year, it was General Cody. Uh, and they, they, the guest speaker gives a few remarks, and then the under the uh, well, actually they, they pa pass envelopes out. They being the cadre, the TAC officers there at West Point, they pass envelopes to the cadets. They can't wait. They can't open them until the one of the senior officers at West Point tells them to open the envelopes. And in that envelope is what branch that that, that cadet has for his or her future in the army. So it's exciting to see their faces, you know, they're all, you know, like nervous. It's like, you know, the, they, they waiting for that, you know, that lottery ticket, you know, to, to be numbers to be called. And when they open the envelopes, you saw all types of emotions. You saw happy, you saw sad, you saw shock. Uh, and, and, and this one of those things where I can't imagine, you know, being there that night or going into that night, you know, wanting a branch and, and really putting everything you have into getting that branch and one, getting it, so excitement. Two, not getting it, so disappointment. Uh, or, or three, just uh, knowing that I didn't get this branch, but I'm going to make the most of it. You know, so you had that those emotions kind of running high in that room. So that to me, that was exciting. And then I got a chance to the uh, the uh, 61 Air Defenders that got uh, branch ADA. I got a chance to actually pin on their uniform the Air Defense Artillery Branch. So they all came up. They, I, had, I had my ADA hat on. Uh, I pinned the branch insignia on them. I took a photo with them. So it was a long night, uh, shaking hands and taking photos. But that was exciting for me to, these young air defenders now are going to be the future of our branch. And here I am, you know, the commandant, shaking their hand and welcoming them to, to our branch. So that was a memorable night. That, uh, and then I got a chance to tour uh, West Point. Uh, my aide, uh, John, is a graduate of West Point. So I got a, a private tour from John of West Point. So that was a good TDY. So did you, uh, th what kind of stuff, and that thing over there is really bugging me, um, <laughs> what kind of stuff did you do as like, okay, so since you're the commandant and you're over the school, sure. which you can just talk to me like I don't know because <laughs> there's a lot I don't, but also sure. because we want people who are civilians that don't understand. Sure. Well, so like what do you do for ROTC, like as far as like, are you just a proponent for them, like, like you're just kind of like a mentor or do you have like do you have anything to do with the way that ROTCs um, operate and are set up or anything like that? Great question. Uh, really I, I don't have a lot of uh, input into how they're set up. My purpose with engaging with ROTC students is uh, as my sessions mission is to getting those young students to branch ADA. Uh, so my, my uh, it's a not to belittle what I do but it's a sales pitch. It's really getting them to choose my branch, our branch, so that they can become the future uh, air defenders that take us into the, our next, uh, our, our next uh, century. So my, my goal is to really just talk to them about our branch. It's to sell the branch to them. Uh, but I also serve as a mentor. I mean, I, I have cadets at West Point today that, that text me, sir, how are you doing? Or my first duty station, uh, I'm thinking about going to Fort Bliss. What do you think about that? So I get a chance to, to connect with them. Like, I didn't have that back in my day. I wasn't talking to a general as a cadet. So I, I, I'm closing the gap really with, uh, with, with Army senior leaders and, and our future leaders in our Army, just offering them advice, you know, being a sounding board and, uh, and really learning from them. I mean, I learn as much as from them as they, they probably learn from me because I learn how they, how they think, what motivates them, and we take that back upstairs to our team in Okada, uh, and they help build our marketing strategy. How do we, how do we attract those young you know, cadets, ROTC or West Point? into our branch, by talking to them, you kind of understand how they think and what excites them. So I always talk about the lasers that are coming to our branch. You know, we're the first branch in the Army to have lasers on the battlefield, 50 kilowatt lasers. So that lights their eyes up. When I talk about that, oh, they're excited about that. You know, and I even make the little laser sound like pew, 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 because they love things like that. So, so I, I try to use what we have in our branch as a marketing, uh, uh, marketing tool 
to, to get them to come to our branch. I also want to build a, a diverse uh, a, a branch. I mean, I want to, I want to make sure we're, we're reaching out across all ethnicities, all genders, so that our branch reflects, one, our nation. Two, we believe that strength and diversity. We, we, we gain so much by having diverse uh, uh, teammates, diverse soldiers on our team. Uh, so it's, it's, part of it, too, is going after those universities that don't traditionally commission officers into the ADA branch and targeting them to say, hey, why aren't you talking about? And we found that universities that have an air defense cadre member in ROTC typically have more folks that branch ADA because they talk about it. They, they get the cadre member. My job, along with Okada, is to put our you know, information into those universities that don't have an air defender on their staff. Uh, so we're, there, we're, the, we're, we're the voice of the branch to them. Uh, we also do virtual engagements now because of COVID and because of just the cost of flying around. We do virtual engagements. So I've done virtual uh, engagements with, with cadet corps where I talk to 25, 30 cadets that are dialed in to, uh, through MS Teams or dialed in through, uh, through Skype or whatever it means, just sharing with them my experiences and answering their questions about the branch. Uh, so that's one of those ways where it, ROTC is really for us, it's a, it's, it helps us get out there our session's goal. <laughs> you know exactly what to say. <laughs> okay, so um, let's see. What else was I going to ask after that? Okay, so as far as ADA goes, mm -hmm. okay, now we can touch a little bit on, you know, current events. Sure. So where, where, did you, where did you think ADA was whenever you first came over here? Mm. Maybe even whenever you first got into the branch? Sure. And, you know, where do you think it is now? And, and kind of where do you think it's going? Oh, great question. When I first joined the uh, ADA branch, uh, I went to the short red side, short range side. Uh, so really, we were supporting maneuver forces. So we were out there with infantry and armor, providing air defense for those forces as they executed their maneuvers. Uh, so for me, it was exciting. It, it, it was, you know, I was a, uh, a an officer on the ground in a, a maneuver talk, you know, a, a, tra a, a tactical operations center, and I got a chance to really, you know, to, uh, to to feel like I was making an impact, protecting the force. Uh, and then as I grew up in the Army, I saw that our branch had another side. Well, I, I didn't see it then, but I knew we had another side of our branch, the Patriot side. So it wasn't until I became a field grade officer that I had a chance to understand how our Patriot soldiers and our Patriot weapon system contributes to a much larger defense of a, you know, of, of a particular critical asset. So seeing now that, man, we, we have a, a strategic impact, you know, so think about this, all the the headlines that happen, you know, in the world when you hear a Patriot battery is sent somewhere, the headline starts to start to no, start to heat up. You know, U.S. sends Patriot battery to Korea. U.S. sends Patriot battery to Saudi Arabia. It sends a message to our any would-be adversary that we're serious. It, it shows our resolve. So I'm a part of a branch that has a strategic impact. That that one that hits the news lines. We send an infantry battalion somewhere. Not sure always get into the news cycle. <laughs> But we sent a Patriot battalion somewhere, it makes the news cycle. So I knew I was a part of a branch that was, uh, we, we are a strategic asset. We, we, are, we go somewhere and we change the landscape. You know, we make any would-be adversary nervous, you know, like putting a, a fad battery in Korea and places like that. It makes uh, folks who are, who are in competition with us uh, that much more nervous. So we're a part of a branch that really makes a tremendous difference around the world. Uh, and then having to spend time partnering with other nations. You know, as a, other nations purchase Patriot and we have a Patriot battery or battalion in their, in their country, we partner with them. We, we show them how to employ the weapon system. Uh, we, we spend time with them and, and teach them our TTPs on how we do things here in the U.S. and how we fight our weapon system. So that's another aspect of the branch that really young officers just don't appreciate until they have actually done that. When you spend time, you know, with an officer, your counterpart from a foreign nation, it, it is it is it's fulfilling first of all because you're giving back to that nation because they're defending their homeland to them it's a home game you know for us we we typically we enjoy you know away games uh for them it's a home game so being able to share with them and help them defend their homeland it's it's rewarding uh, so our branch really for me has been increasingly more rewarding and exciting as i as i move up in the uh, in the branch and now you know being here at, as a commandant it's i, I see it as sort of the pinnacle you know, where you get a chance to really see all of that come together and, and also coupled with you train that, you train those soldiers who are gonna go out there. And also I get a chance to talk to future battalion and brigade commanders here at the schoolhouse. When they come here for the pre-command course, I get a chance to share with them my thoughts about leadership and my thoughts about my time in battalion and brigade command. But more importantly, I get to share with them the new things that are happening in our branch. So they now go out into command more informed on where our branch is going so they can spread that to our, their soldiers 
uh, and it really increased the, the, the excitement really for the branch because it is exciting. New weapon systems coming on board, new formations coming on board. Uh, it's, it's a great time to be an air defender. That was good. <laughs> okay, so um, did you want to say, um, well, I don't want to delve too far, but did you want to say kind of, um, you know, did you have any farewells you want to Oh, yeah, say? sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Really, I, I've been blessed to have a wonderful team. Since I arrived, this team has, well, actually before I arrived, I'll take it back to, uh, prior to me arriving, this team has gone above and beyond to take care of me, to integrate me and my family. Although my family stayed back in Virginia when they did come uh, to visit, uh, this team did an amazing job taking care of them. Uh, every day when I come to work, I really serve with one of the best teams on Fort Seal. Now, I'm, I'm biased because this is my team, uh, but I, I've uh, made my way around to shake hands with a lot of people on post. You know, I've been to uh, the, uh, the RATCH, you know, the, the hospital here to, to, to award, uh, recognize our medical professionals. Uh, and and I, I, I'm thankful for my team. My team has done an amazing job. And really from Mr. Simley's leadership, you know, as the, uh, as the uh, deputy commandant, he as a civilian leader that has, you know, really commanded the respect of this team and certainly my respect. Uh, he, he's a really a miracle in terms of what he's gone through and still comes in every day with a smile on his face and really uh, you know, gives everything he has to this branch and to our team. And how he leads our civilian workforce is simply remarkable. Uh, I, I don't have a, a concern with how he's leading our team because he's leading them well. Uh, and uh, and for, the, for the uniform personnel on our team, Command Sergeant Major uh, and I are just really blessed and we watch the NCOs come in and the soldiers come in and they do an amazing job. Our NCOs in Okada, I mean, they, they really get after the mission of, one, bringing in the, the best uh, cadets we can out of the uh, commissioning sources, but two, updating our videos so that we can attract those great, uh, great young officers and NCOs, uh, being professionals at what they do in terms of knowing uh, the MOSs that they, they specialize in. Uh, you talk about Dave, our historian, and does a tremendous job at really educating our, our young air defenders and some of our old ones, too, about the rich history here at Fort Seal, first of all, and about the uh, about the, uh, the the legacy of our branch, uh, so so kudos to, certainly to, to Dave, uh, and and I'm trying to think the upstairs piece. You know, I want to I want to miss anyone, uh, but I'd like to thank everyone. I mean, the, our Al Qaeda team, which includes you know Lieutenant Colonel Esron and and Master Sergeant Wolford and and our NCOs, your staff, uh, you know De, uh, Don prior to you, now you are on board, uh, and Griffin. Really, it's, it's a first-rate crew. Uh, I have nothing but uh, tremendous accolades for all of you. Uh, the podcast that you not only did for me, but you extended that. Uh, I hope you keep that going. Uh, that's a great asset right there, giving our Air Defenders you know, a chance to have a voice on a podcast. That's amazing. You know? and, and our team uh, up there with uh, knowledge management, uh, we, we do a great job at really you know, putting together all the assets and resources uh, that will help educate the future uh, air defenders and also the current air defenders. Uh, and coming downstairs, you know, to my media staff, uh, I, I got my EXO, my aide, uh, both former and, and present uh, have been phenomenal. Uh, I've been really blessed. Uh, I, I've had the opportunity to select two great officers uh, as my aide and two great officers to be my EXO. And, uh, and Dr. Davis keeps us all grounded. You know, she's the, uh, she, she's the supervisor of all of us uh, and just a joy they have around. Uh, and she cares deeply about what she does and what, and, and what the team does. Uh, and the, uh, our other teammates, uh, I look at Jen and, uh, and uh, Kay as my, my counselors, my advisors on all things uh, truck related. Uh, we share stories about, you know, about, about trucks uh, and just really a joy to go down and, and talk to them. They're not only they're professionals at what they do, but they're great to have around. I, I enjoy really just spending time. When I'm sitting here in the office, I got a break, I'll walk down and I'll chat with them and, and uh, bounce ideas off of them. So it's really a joy, gonna, gonna miss them. Our NCOs and soldiers, you know, my, my driver Herbert has been amazing, you know, to go from place to place and, and never got me lost. Uh, and he's so respectful. And, and when I see him, when I walk out the door, standing by the truck, he's holding my little placard, you know, and he's smiling with a salute. It really makes my day, you know. And then Master Sergeant Johnson and, and now, uh, you know, Sergeant Prince, uh, they've been just uh, amazing. Uh, in terms of taking care of me. Master Sergeant Johnson is one of the most professional NCOs that I've served with in my military career. Uh, not only fit, uh, but just a straight professional. He, he is really someone that, uh, that uh, really epitomizes what we want in our NCO Corps. Uh, I've had two great uh, assistant commandants. You know, I've had uh, 
uh, Doug Simmons and now uh, uh, Todd Daniels. Both are amazing officers. I didn't know uh, the gentleman before we uh, before we started working here together, uh, but I, I go to war with those guys any time. Uh, very articulate, very smart. Uh, they care about what they do. They care about our branch, uh, and uh, both of them have done just an amazing job uh, here and, and are great teammates. Uh, and and uh, the CWAB, uh, Chief Brown, has been an amazing CWAB, uh, very knowledgeable. He really cares about the uh, one, the one officer cohort. Uh, he and uh, now Chief Crothers have been just amazing in terms of taking our one officer cohort to another level uh, and just continue to be professional. You know, and before Crothers, it was Hemingway who did an amazing job. Uh, Hemingway was my soldier back in 3-4 at Fort Bragg uh, as a sergeant. You know, to see him now, you know, retired as a CW3, just amazing. Uh, and, uh, and moving down the line, I mean, our, our techs, you know, our, our combo, Sergeant Paris, uh, and, uh, and our uh, now new combo, NCO, uh, new combo civilian, Kevin, we couldn't do our job without those folks. You know, it's always, they're the unsung heroes. You know, when things are, uh, are going well, you don't hear Paris's voice or name being called. You don't see Kevin. As soon as something breaks, they're the first name we call. You know, they're like the Maytag men for, for us. Uh, and they've been an amazing, uh, amazing professionals. Uh, I don't worry about communication things with those two on the job. They've done an amazing job and uh, certainly honored to, uh, to have them uh, as teammates. Uh, and certainly, I think I've, I've hit most of uh, the folks here. If I miss anyone, I do apologize. Uh, oh, our NCOs from the, uh, from the National Guard. Uh, great NCOs in the National Guard team, always there to lend a hand. Uh, our great officer, Captain Cummings, has done an amazing job. He's new to the job, serving as a captain in this job. Our, uh, his predecessor was a major who's promotable to lieutenant colonel. Uh, he stepped in and really has rolled his sleeves up and been a great teammate. So certainly, certainly proud of him uh, to have him on our team. Uh, and, and to be a part of uh, the, uh, the Commandant's team. Uh, and, and really, I think, uh, last but not least, certainly my battle buddy, uh, Sergeant Major Gray. Uh, he and I go way back. Uh, I knew him as a first sergeant, he knew me as a major. And he has been the same way the entire time. The consummate professional, tremendous character, loyalty to, to, to that entire team, not just me, the entire team. Would give the shirt off his back for anyone. And I can't thank him enough for being a great battle buddy. Uh, I couldn't have picked a better command sergeant major and a better teammate. Uh, we've had tremendous laughs together. We've had some tough times together. Uh, and, and really, you know, he's been there for me, and, and certainly I hope I've been there for him uh, through, uh, through, through the times we had together. I'll never forget him. Uh, the Army, when he does retire, the Army will lose a tremendous leader who cares. I just like how he mentors his peers. You've very few, you know, senior leaders, senior NCOs in particular, spend time mentoring their peers. He spends time talking to his peers because it's lonely at the top. You know, there's only one E9 in a battalion and in a brigade. Uh, I take that back, the, the op sergeant major, but the, the command sergeant major uh, position is, uh, is only one in that command position. And he goes above and beyond, you know, mentoring those command sergeant majors out there uh, and making sure that they have a voice, you know, especially the ones that are in nominative positions at WMDC sergeant majors. You know, uh, they call him and, and they ask questions and they bounce ideas off of him. I think that's remarkable. You know, we need more of that, you know, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship and peer-to-peer and -peer, uh, just relationship building. Uh, so certainly uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss him as I head off to this next, uh, this next endeavor. That's good. So is there anybody in particular, like on Fort Sill, uh, you know, as like your fellow officers and, and I'd say the on your level of, you know, Anyone that you're going to be missing? Oh, yeah. Anything about Fort Sill? Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Absolutely. Uh, one, the CG. And I'm not saying this because of my report card. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's been an amazing boss. I, I, I met General Camper when uh, he's my War College classmate. He was our class president in War College in 2014. Uh, he went after Brigade Command. I went before Brigade Command. So that's how uh, he was there as a very senior colonel. Uh, but he's been the same way. And he's led this organization, this installation, I should say, uh, with dignity, respect, with care, compassion. Uh, we are a better installation having had him as our CG because uh, he has that, that, that culture of really uh, inclusiveness. Everyone's included. Uh, the, inclusive, uh, and, and, and the culture of just accountability also. I mean, he's a man that, hey, this is your responsibility. You own this, and I, I'm, I'm holding you accountable. So I appreciate that. So I'm certainly going to miss him. And just he's a great to have around. He always jokes. He always has a smile. Always has a hunting story to share with you. He and I allegedly I may have you know done some hunting together, uh, but uh, I'm certainly going to miss him. I, I will miss the the uh, the, the history of the installation. 
uh, when you think about it, and I, I shared some of this during the, uh, the, the Black History Month podcast, this installation was built by Buffalo soldiers, you know, the majority of it. And to be on this installation, to walk around as a general officer, I can't imagine what those, those old souls are, or could imagine it, that I would be here one day. You know, we, we didn't have that back in their day. And, and to me, for me to be here now, I just imagine them smiling down on me, you know, and, and to be in the house there. I shared that during the podcast, you know, built by Buffalo Soldiers, you know, and, and I'm living there now. It's just amazing to, to walk by the, or drive by the Flipper Ditch and know that, you know, what that young man did, you know, saved lives here at Fort Seal, you know, by building that ditch to irrigate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the land here so that we can protect against, you know, malaria. So, so the contributions that, that Buffalo Soldiers and African Americans made to this installation, it's been great to be here, to be promoted here, to serve here an installation, uh, to me has, has been something that I'll, I'll never forget and I'm gonna miss it. The community, I, I like how, and I share this with my friends back home, is that when you talk to someone outside the gate in Lawton, they say Lawton Fort Seal, it's not just Lawton to them, it's Lawton Fort Seal. I go to Fort Bragg, they say Fayetteville and Fort Bragg, it's a difference. Here is Lawton Fort Seal, it's no different. And the community has really embraced the installation and the installation has embraced the community. I like how the CG started the Frontier Fringe program where we bring community leaders onto the installation and show them what we do, give them a day in the life of a soldier. And they come out and participate in our ceremonies, they come out to our stable calls. It really ties the community very close together. So, so, so what we've done here with tying the community and the installation together is better than I've seen anywhere else I've served at. Uh, so uh, Dr. Davis, my, my EA, you know, affectionately calls me the people's general. You know, people in the community, you know, know about me and, and they talk about me and they're excited for me, you know, being here and, uh, and they want to know me. Just uh, on a, a Saturday, I'm heading out to the VFW uh, and I'm going to talk to some of our veterans there at the VFW and they're so excited for me to come out there. When I went to the car show, I just wanted to go to the car show and see old cars and new cars and, and just have, you know, a, a relaxing Saturday. And I wind up talking to four veterans who just were blown away when I told them that I was a Brigadier General. Uh, and it's just one of those things where this community really admires service. They really admire leaders in the Army uh, and they want to be connected. I've heard so many stories from, from retirees and I listen and I smile and I'm like, man, he's, he just doesn't know that uh, he's really making my day. Because uh, I know that because of his sacrifices, his service, that I'm allowed to be here as a Brigadier General, uh, especially uh, the African-American uh, NCOs and soldiers who served years ago, you know, they sort of paved the way for us. And I haven't, I'll never forget that. Uh, so to me, it's, it's me giving back to them saying, thank you. Uh, my time is valuable, so they say. But for me, my time is everyone else's time. Uh, I, I get joy in engaging with people and spending time with people. Uh, that's what gives me joy and keeps me, you know, keeps me motivated. That's good. So um, let me ask you this. I've been going for a minute. Am I doing okay? I thought I did. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. I think we went over pretty much everything. Oh, family life, you talk about that? Oh, yeah. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, sure. You know, to your family or oh, yeah. your family? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I got tons of those. No, r really, I, I just want to say thank you to my family. I mean, they, they have endured a lot of me being gone. This tour being, uh, being uh, one of them, you know, probably the longest, actually, you know, because before this, I was a year in Korea and I had a year of deployments. Uh, this has been the longest. Uh, and really to them, thanks for being just, you know, one, a great wife and two great kids. Uh, they are super resilient. They've continued to do well in spite of my absence, and they make me proud. My wife has gotten promotions every year that she's been back there in Virginia by herself. You know, I went to Korea. She was a manager of her, of her career field, in, in her career field. And then she got promoted to director, and then the next year she got promoted to executive director. You know, all the while I'm away, you know, she's back there being a mom and being a leader in the organization, that's, that's amazing. It's astonishing that, that she can do that. And there's also, she's gotten master's degrees when I deployed. My wife has two master's degrees because I deployed twice. If I deploy again, she'll be a doctor. You know, so she does amazing things in spite of me being gone and still, you know, is a great mom to our kids. Uh, to my oldest daughter, Leah, you know, she has really come into her own. Uh, she works at the Civil War Museum in Richmond, Virginia as the media manager. As in her career field, she has a master's degree in communications, and she's really coming to her own. She's got her own desk now, and I bought a nice nameplate for her desk, and she has grown into a really 
really great young lady and a uh, really responsible young lady. Uh, so I'm super proud of her. My daughter, Alexa, I call her my baby girl, turns 21 on Sunday. And really, I could not be more proud of her, too. She is independent. She's smart. She's driven. When she wants something, she goes for it. Just recently, she's got a job at the Apple store in the mall in Austin, Texas. And she was like on the floor greeting guests. That wasn't what she wanted to do. She wanted more. She studied and she interviewed. And now she's a tech specialist at the Apple store. Just an example of her drive is that she wants something, she goes to get it. I feel comfortable about her. She's going to be okay. She's my 401k plan. I'm invested in her. Uh, I'm going to live with her when, uh, when I get old. Uh, that's on Colin. He is just an easy young man. He is no trouble at all. Uh, he's super smart, and he has the biggest heart. He asks his mom all day, every day, does she need anything? Can, she, can he do anything for her? Uh, just as such a gentleman, and, and really, I credit his mom for that because I've been away quite a bit. You know, he's uh, he'll be 16 in June, and uh, I've been gone probably about six years of that of his 16 years on this earth. You know, and so I credit his mom for his just his calm demeanor, his intelligence, uh, his just uh, his just drive to make sure everyone around him is comfortable. Uh, he spends his time helping others be comfortable and make sure they need. Uh, he loves video games. Uh, he and I do play video games uh, together over the Internet, and uh, I win some and he wins some. Uh, I will say he quit playing football with me because I win a lot on football, uh, but he beats me on Mortal Kombat. You know, so, but uh, but the, the idea that you know, a father and a son can connect over a video game, you know, it's, it's, the new, it's the new way to connect. You know, it's not always back in the day where you're tossing footballs around your son or you're, you're doing other things. You know, now it's, it's the video games. I went into his world. His world has been video games since he was, you know, a toddler. And, and, and I went into his world and, uh, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it. So they, they've managed to do exceptionally well in spite of my absence. And uh, I could not be more proud of them. I'm excited to go home. Uh, these two weeks can't go fast enough uh, by so I can get home. Uh, this is my first time living in the same house with them in, uh, in roughly three years. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. A bit nervous because uh, I'm sure there's going to be toothpaste on the sink. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be cabinet doors left open. I'm sure there's going to be dirty clothes laying around. And, and I'm going to have to go back home and, and take, a, you know, take a, a chill pill so that I don't, because uh, you know, I'm used to, in my house, I put things down, it stays there. No, no one touches it, it doesn't move. Uh, a little different back home. Uh, so I'm taking some patient pills right now, I call it, not, but uh, I'm really just really relaxing a little bit and not going back home and trying to, you know, you know turn everything over. I realize they've been surviving, doing great well, great work without me, and, and, I, and I, I'm just happy to be home. Uh, so I'll look past the toothpaste for a while, I'll look past the open cabinet doors for a while uh, until I ease it into the, uh, into the, the routine at home. There you go. All right. So what is your, uh, what's your next What's next for you? Oh, great. Yeah, I uh, is officially notified that uh, I was officially notified that I'm going to be the next G357 of TRADOC, Training Doctrine Command at Fort Eustis, Virginia. Well, Joint Base Langley Eustis in uh, Newport News, Virginia. Right. It's about an hour and 15 minutes from my house. I intend to commute every day. Uh, if the hours get late, I'll grab a hotel room or stay, you know, stay with some friends there in, uh, in the Virginia area, Tidewater area. But yeah, I'm excited about that. It's a, it's a first time for an air defender to have that type of job, the G3 of a four-star command. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity. I, I really tie it to, um, I, I have uh, 380 people on my staff. 255 of those are civilians. So I really tie it to my time at Fort Pickett. When I had a chance to work with civilians at Fort Pickett, that opportunity, like the Army, Army has a great way of building you as a leader, giving you opportunities to work leadership muscles that you don't necessarily work on a daily basis. So going to Fort Pickett, I work with civilians, the interagency, you know, Department of State Homeland Security. I work with uh, contract doctors, contract nurses who they don't, they don't work with generals every day. They, they, this is, it, doesn't, it doesn't move them. You know? It moves soldiers, but it doesn't move civilians, contractors. But earning their respect getting them to really understand that, at one, I'm a person, two, uh, two, I'm a general officer, three, I care about you and what you do for the team. That, to me, really prepared me, will prepare me for my next opportunity to, to lead again uh, of a mostly predominantly uh, civilian organization. So spending time at Pickett, for me, was a, a dual purpose. One, working with civilians and growing as a leader, uh, leading civilians, inspiring civilians to, uh, to do you know, their job and to do it well. Two, seeing, uh, seeing Afghans uh, guests, we call them guests because they were a guest in our, in our country, seeing them come in with, with really nothing, closing their back, uh, and being a source of hope for them, 
you know, my team and I provided food, water, shelter, and safety. The essentials, the bare essentials, we provided that to our Afghans uh, guests. Uh, for me, it's 110 days I did that. So that was probably the defining moment for my career. You know, having someone, you know, thousands of people, at, at the highest point, we had over 7,000 Afghans on the ground in Fort Pickett. 7,000 that look for you for food, water, shelter, and safety. It's pretty, you know, one a daunting task, uh, a, lot, a lot of stress, but I had such a wonderful team to help me with that. You know, we, we started out with infantry task force, uh, infantry battalion out of Fort Campbell. They were relieved by a Marine battalion uh, and, uh, and, and really, and then a Marine uh, Brigade headquarters showed up to help me kind of command and control the organization. But really, I saw services, joint force come together there at Fort Pickett uh, to really, you know, do a mission that really is, is, is uh, uh, hasn't been done for years on the scope and scale that we did it on, you know, the, uh, the safe haven we provided there for the Afghans. Working with local and state leaders, I mean, I met the governor uh, of Virginia, came to visit the, uh, our, our uh, operations there at Fort Pickett. I got a chance to meet the Deputy Secretary, Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, Dr. Hicks. Uh, came to visit our, uh, our operations there. The Chief Staff of the Army came to visit. Uh, the, the, the Adjutant General of Virginia, you know, General Williams, obviously came to visit several times. So working with the Guard uh, was, was uh, unique and, and a great opportunity for me to grow again as a leader, working outside my comfort zone. So uh, I'm taking that back to my next job, and I think those experiences will help me in that uh, my next op my next job there at Tradoc headquarters. Okay, awesome. Is that good? Yep. All right. I'm Woo. glad you put that picture. I know, I saw that. I looked down. I, <laughs> I looked down on my note card. Yeah. I, like, oh, yeah, I, said, I found a way to weave it in. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I can weave that in. I got that. Yeah. Okay, well, other than that, did you have anything else to uh, say? Really? I think we covered pretty much everything. I think we did. Just, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to, one, to say thank you to the team. Uh, I, I, I'll say some things at my farewell, obviously, uh, but, but certainly for you to capture the video, you know, for my family and, uh, for others to see, I appreciate that. You know, so thanks for taking the time and uh, and getting on the calendar to do that. Yeah. A lot of people get on the calendar and waste my time. Th this was a great opportunity, great <laughs> use of my time. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah. Um